been eroded is that time that we used to have to actually contemplate and reflect on, again, where we find ourselves, what our situation is, and what do we want to do about it. And when we don't have that as human beings, the quality of our decision making deteriorates rapidly. So we haven't noticed while that this this time for reflective thought has been chipped away at until all of a sudden we get to a place where you know overwhelm becomes a common experience. It becomes something you experience every day for many people. Hey, it's Rocky. Welcome to Richer Soul. Today's guest is Dr. Paul Knapper, who is going to share how we create agency and and overwhelm in our lives. Imagine it's 12 months from now and you've achieved your major life goals. How does it feel to be in the best shape of your life? to wake up energized, excited about the day, to have great relationships and friends who support you and propel you forward. How does it feel to have an excess of money, to be able to make the choices you want, to be fearless and open to trying new adventures? Imagine being connected to the universe and it providing everything you desire. It's possible over time and your past does not dictate your future. The only thing holding you back from this vision is you. It's time to take control of our thoughts and use them to our advantage. Welcome to Richer Soul, where we achieve our dreams and bring balance to health, wealth, relationships, time, and spirituality. If you have not had a chance to listen to episodes one through nine, I encourage you to go back and listen to the framework behind Richer Soul and how to create the life of your dreams. You can also find all the show notes for this episode at richersoul.com. While you're there, you can sign up for a monthly email where I share the best articles I read this month, let you know about upcoming episodes, and share a little wisdom. You can also listen to coaching calls under the coaching calls tab. I also share the most interesting articles I read every week on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash richer soul. And there's also a Facebook group where you can ask questions Inter interact with other listeners. This week's quote is from Winston Churchill. When you're 20, you care what everyone thinks. When you're 40, you stop caring what everyone thinks. When you're 60, you realize no one was ever thinking about you in the first place. I find that hilarious and true. Today, we're going to go deep on what you think and how you should think but not on what what you should think. Before we do, let's review last week's action step. Creating a list of people you know and continuing to build trust with them. This is a skill that I'm always working on improving with regards to networking, and I have to improve my systems around it. I use video emails and handwritten thank you cards. I just finished reading the seven levels of communication Go From Relationships to Referrals by Michael Mayer. This is a must-read book if you want to have people to refer to you or you just want to build a strong network that can support you. It's got actionable steps along with the mindset, mindset shifts you need to make. And it's in a story format, so it's an easy read. We are certainly in unstable economic times. If you're employed, you never know when you can be let go. It could be something totally outside of your control. That's why building a network is so important. When you need a job, you already have people on your side who want to help you. You don't want to be in the position where you have to start networking from a position of need. You're less likely to get help. So build the social capital before you need it. We have many episodes where we talk about that. Make sure you have a great LinkedIn profile and you're connecting with others. If you're not connected with me on LinkedIn, please reach out. In the note, tell me you're a listener. I've spent months building up my LinkedIn profile and reaching out to people. 
Another book that I loved is called LinkedIn Riches by John Nemo. We're connected on LinkedIn, and I met him at Social Media Marketing World last year. The book is free on his website. I highly recommend it to build up your LinkedIn profile, because now more than ever, that's where business gets done, on LinkedIn, not necessarily the golf course. Companies will actually search you out and reach out to you if you're the type of person they need to hire. Today's guest is Dr. Paul Knapper who leads a management psychology practice. His clients include Fortune 500 companies, nonprofits, universities, and startups. He has held an advanced fellowship during a three-year academic appointment at Harvard Medical School. And he is the co-author of the new book, The Power of Agency, The Seven Principles to Conquer Obstacles, Make Effective Decisions, and Create a Life on Your Own Terms. Let's meet our guest. Welcome to Richer Soul, Dr. Paul Knapper. It's great to have you join us today. Oh, thanks very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'm excited for the conversation and to learn from you and more about your book. But we always start at the beginning. What was it like when you were growing up and how much did your family and school teach you about money? It's a great question. And you know what? I don't know that I've ever been asked that question before. So it really, it really is a, a, a rich, a deep kind of question. Um, so I grew up in a, in a working family. Both my parents <clears throat> worked. Um, my parents divorced when I was young. My mother was a career person. Um, she pursued a career in human resources and was actually quite successful. Uh, my father is an, is an engineer and worked for many years in a, in a, in a small engineering uh, organization that did a lot of auto related work. And both of them were very responsible, um, ab- about money. <clears throat> they, uh, they, they believed in working hard. They believed in, you know, keeping track of, you know, I remember both, both my parents, my father still does this balancing their checkbooks <clears throat> religiously every month. Um, you know, there was a sense of order, order <clears throat> and knowing where you stood uh, with with money and and a respect for money. And so, you know, that was um, that was inculcated into me as a, as a kid. Just, you know, uh, I observed it. Um, I remember distinctly since you asked this question, you know, that it popped up into my head. I remember distinctly as a kid having a discussion with a family friend. My mother was there at the time, and we, we, we talked about business a lot at the dinner table. And this discussion happened over dinner. And the discussion was about revenue versus profit. And I was just a kid, and the, um, the family friend was stressing the point that there's a big difference between the amount of money you take in in revenue and what you can record as profit. And I must have been 10 years old or, or, or around there. And I distinctly remember that um, conversation. Um, so I grew up in a, in a, and I learned something from that conversation. Obviously, I still remember it today. So I grew up in a family that, you know, we, we you know, work was important. We talked about work. We talked about money. We, you know, my parents saved money. I mean, so they were responsible um, financially. Um, and, uh, you know, we... Uh, you know, both had both had homes um, that they purchased, and um, so I, and I grew up kind of in, in 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 that type of environment. I remember also in high school, I went to public school, and economics was an elective in high school. It was an elective course, and I can't remember if it was one or two semesters. I think it may have just been a one semester course. But in any case, I took the elective. I took the class. I loved it. I thought it made such sense. It was so grounding and, you know, it just illuminated everything that we deal with um, in the world around us. And I distinctly remember at the time um, thinking to myself, why is this an elective course? Why isn't this a required course? Because what occurred to me at the time, and I was 17 years old, probably, what occurred to me at the time was, you know, this is fundamentally what America is all about. I mean, we are a nation of, of business, you know, capitalism is a, a, a you know, a, a, it's a business oriented 
system, uh, economic system. And if we don't understand how our how that system works and the basics, the fundamentals of it, you know, we're really at a huge disadvantage. So I just remember that being another yet, you know, another pivotal moment for me, um, you know, kind of in terms of my own um, education around money and and finance and, and and economics and you know from there I just I, I've always been interested in um, in economics and business and in college took courses in economics and um, and enjoyed them I just I just they they made they made sense to me they they were interesting and you know until I got to a place where it got so abstract when I was you know lo- uh, studying international economics I thought like okay this is this is this is no longer really making any kind of sense to me. And so um, which was interesting because that was in the days before we had behavioral economics where, you know, kind of blending psychology in with economics. So we literally were, you know, looking at at at, you know, at charts and um, trend lines that that made all kinds of assumptions that to me seemed completely, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, ridiculous, right? Assuming that human beings are fully rational when we, of course, know <laughs> that's not true. So in any case, that's a, but, but that's kind of where I got my sort of grounding, uh, financially was from my parents and grew growing up in Detroit in um, the auto industry as the, as the, as the, as the backdrop. Um, so a lot of auto related business going on and I you know, was a huge car fan. So, you, you know, knew everything about cars when I was a small kid and, um, you know, still to that, still have a passion for automobiles to this day. So, um, uh, anyway, so that's kind of a, in a nutshell, my, my financial, you know, where I got my mindset. And that's an interesting story. You brought up some points that, I probably haven't thought about in forever. And one is you said your father still balances his checkbook to this day. I balance my checkbook probably twice a month. I do everything electronically. I because I essentially run my personal finances like a business. And I I just naturally assume everybody balances their checkbook and I hope they do. And we haven't really said that on the show because it to me, it's just like breathing. It's just what you do. So I'm hoping everyone is actually balancing their checkbook every month. I don't know. if I, I, Do you think people are? I've never seen any research on this. Uh, so I, I would just be giving you uh, uh, an uneducated guess. But Rocky, I would I would. I would imagine that the vast majority of Americans do not balance their checkbook. I would, I would, I would venture a guess that it may be on the order of 10%, 20%, maybe who do balance their checkbooks each month. Uh, but again, that's just a, a, that's really just a guess. Um, so I, I think the vast majority of people do not. I'm going to put that on social media and see what people say. Yeah, it would be a great poll, <laughs> wouldn't it? It would be an interesting poll. It would be. And then you said another thing. You talked about how this guest came over and they talked about top line revenue versus profit. Now, you've been through business, right? And you're involved in that whole space. How often do you see people make that distinction? And did they even make that distinction in school? It's a good question. Um, you know, I it, it's it's interesting because it's hard to answer the question just because uh, it's the topic doesn't come up that often, right? I mean, people, I, 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 I can't recall a recent conversation, uh, with very many people on the topic of, you know, profit versus revenue. Um, but, you know, I think that in what I see is in my life, I have some people, some friends and, uh, and business associates who, are very financially oriented. And, um, and I just know that they completely understand the distinction. Um, and you know, we have discussions about finance and stock market and, um, the macro economy, all that kinds of, all that kind of stuff. And I just know they're really grounded in that. And then I have other friends who I just never talk about, uh, financial things or really even business things with them. And so what I would, to answer your question, 
I, I have no idea if they know the difference. And if I were to ask them, I am willing to bet that probably many, if not most of them would struggle to, would struggle to find, uh, to, 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 to make the distinction, but between those two, but since I've not had the conversation with, 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 with those people, um, you know, I don't, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure how they would answer the question. And that's interesting. I'm, I'm really starting to learn that I'm in a bubble and I need to get <laughs> out of that bubble because most of the bubble I'm in is in the financial space. A lot of my friends do financial blogs, they have podcasts, we, you know, and I'm, I'm in this little space doing that. And I'm starting to realize just how much most people are out of whack with that. Um, and it's, it's interesting to do that. You're right. I'm sure you're, you're very right. I mean, we say in our book that one common thing that occurs almost across the board is that we as people assume other people are more similar to us than they in fact really are. And so, you know, we, I do the same thing. We, we assume people have skills or knowledge uh, or awareness of things that we have. and and we're often surprised when we learn that they don't share those things. They don't have that knowledge. They don't, you know, so it's, it's always important to kind of try to check on that, that assumption that we make that other people are, again, more similar to, to ourselves than they really are. And that's very true. You also mentioned behavioral economics, which has really helped me to better understand why people behave the way they do, because we don't always behave rationally. And, and that's a shame. So you actually started out on Wall Street, correct? I did. Yes. I started out in uh, an investment research and one of the big uh, investment uh, management firms, um, JP Morgan. So I was in their investment research department and uh, it was a great learning experience uh, to learn about business and finance and how the stock market works and, you know, how, how companies make money. And that's a big part of it is understanding those, those types of things. Because even as an individual investor, if you're going to invest in the stock market, you should understand what you're buying. Because what you're doing is buying a part of a company and you should be able to read their balance sheets and look at their profitability and make wise decisions. That's, that's, that's exactly right. And, and, but as you're, as you're suggesting too, it, it, that's a learned skill. It's, uh, and, and I think that um, for many people, if not probably the majority of people, um, that's a daunting task, right? I mean, if you gave people an annual report um, to look at and, and said, um, you know, what do you think about this company? Do you think this would be a good company to invest in? I think, I think you'd probably have, you know, at least 75% of, of the people you asked that question to kind of feeling a little stumped, right? A little put on the spot and uh, not sure what, you know, and, and then if you ask the further question of what are you basing that on? You know, what are you, what is it that you're basing that recommendation on? Yes or no. Uh, what are you basing it on? Um, you know, that's a, that's a, the, for the average person, they don't, they don't have that skill. They haven't, they haven't picked it up along the way. Um, and again, it's learned that's, that's simply knowledge. It's, it's, a, it's a learned skill, but it's not really taught that widely. And, um, you know, gets me into some other, you know, uh, tangential topic that I often think about, which is that I wish that in a basic economics course, macroeconomics, microeconomics, were required of all of our political leaders, of every congressman, of every senator, because, you know, I think that, that in terms of financial uh, literacy, you know, we there's a lot of financial illiteracy in our country, and I'm sure you see it as well. Most of our politicians are not financial people. They don't understand finances at all, which is part of the reason we're in the mess that we're in and in our school systems don't teach money. I, I, that is my underlying goal is that the more money people have and the more that they have that financial foundation, it gives you the ability to do more in life, but it, it also creates for you the foundation to make wiser decisions. 
and it gives you the freedom to make them. And it, it, that is the underlying goal of what this is all about, is to give people that freedom. Because when they have that freedom and that choice, we no longer need politicians because we don't need someone to solve our problems. We can solve them ourselves, which is why I was so excited to have you on, because the book that you wrote and what we talk about here go so much together. So I always try to, I always like to understand the backstory. And so the book is The Power of Agency, The Seven Principles to Conquer Obstacles, Make Effective Decisions, and Create a Life on Your Own Terms. And creating a life on our, your own terms is what this is all about. What inspired you to write the book? Well, you know, it's a really, really great question. I how this book, this project got started is I work in business with, with leaders, business leaders, um, generally, you know, larger sized companies. Um, and I do a lot of development work, executive development, leadership, coaching, uh, that kind of thing. And I was finding in the, the, the people I work with, the population of, of business leaders I work with that many of them were complaining about, um, feeling overwhelmed. More frequently, uh, when I first started out doing the work I do, uh, I would occasionally hear from a business leader that they had an overwhelming day or an overwhelming week or, you know, but what I was finding is that um, I was hearing it much, much more often. And so I started diving into that to understand what does that mean? What is overwhelm? What, how does that, how do you define that? You know, what's going on? What's causing it? And it was really uh, related closely to, um, to to people being cognitively, you know, in over their heads, too much information, too quickly, really being challenged to um, to you know to assimilate and um, integrate and make decisions um, based on um, things changing so quickly. So, so, so I was finding that leaders were feel, were feeling this and these are some pretty capable people, you know, in, in general. Um, and then I compared notes with a colleague of mine who works with families and, and with kids, he was noticing the same exact phenomenon in his population. And so we put our heads together to try to understand in a deeper way what was going on. Why were people feeling this sense of, of overwhelm, you know, much more, more frequently in their lives? And, and what was also the downside cost to that? You know, what, what effects was, what effects were, were, was it having on their, their lives, you know, so both physically, mentally, um, and, um, and so we, we sought to understand this more deeply. We conducted a lot of interviews. We realized that, you know, um, things have accelerated to such a, a point over the last 30 years that we are all in a, a, a race to adapt, a race to adapt to um, a very, very fast changing world, a uh, fast changing set of economic um, circumstances. Um, socially things are changing very, very fast. Um, and it's, it's stripped, it, it's kind of gone beyond our ability to, to cope and adapt in the moment, um, much of the time. So that's why people are reporting, feeling overwhelmed m more often. You know, it's not, they're overwhelmed every minute of every day, but they're experiencing periods of momentary overwhelm much more often. It's related also to what we found when we die, we dove into the data that there's actually um, a silent epidemic of anxiety going on in, in, in the United States. Most people are not aware of this. 20% of Americans uh, carry around a clinical diagnosis of anxiety disorder. Um, and we have obviously you know, many millions more who are undiagnosed um, or who are just below the clinical threshold. So we're, we're a very anxious country. Now, that anxiety relates also to overwhelm. So we, we sought to write a book to explore this phenomenon, to understand it more deeply, to understand what effect it was having on all of us. And what we learned is one of the biggest effects is it was, it was suppressing our agency, our agency as, 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 as human beings. And an agency, as you said, Rocky, is, is really our, our capacity to create, create a life on our own terms 
a life that is uniquely ours, suited to our interests and abilities. Um, and um, people, in a lot of ways, their agency has been um, suppressed uh, because of all of the overwhelm and anxiety. So we wrote a book to try to give people the skills to um, build, rather than treat the symptom of, 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 of anxiety and overwhelm. So it's not a time management book, you know, giving you, um, you know, simple, uh, sort of things to, um, treat a symptom. It's designed to get underneath the problem, which is, which is human agency. How can you build greater agency in your life so that you actually can create that life on your terms? And that will help reduce the amount of overwhelm you experience, it'll also try to, uh, it also should lessen the amount of anxiety, um, that, that, that you may expose yourself to. And so we wrote the book with that in mind to try to address this, this phenomenon that we were experiencing, that, that, that my colleague and I were experiencing in our professional worlds. And so let's just take a step back and just so that the audience gets it. When, when you say agency, what does it mean to have agency? Yeah, that's that's a, that's that's a, the the most uh, important question because agency is not that familiar to most people. I mean, they you know they occasionally may see it in the newspaper article or you know so, so, someone may say it on television in, in passing, and, and people probably think they know what it is, but they're not quite sure. So agent, what I like to say is agency, human agency is, you know, probably the most important concept that you've never heard of. Um, you know, so it kind of relates a little bit to what we're talking about in terms of, you know, knowledge of economics and finance. It's a, it's an area of, of knowledge that most people have not simply not been exposed to. So agency is something that's been studied, um, for many, many, many decades by, psychologists and philosophers and sociologists. And most simply put, agency is our capacity to make uh, decisions, make choices in our lives, and then act on those choices. So, you know, the, the reason it's such a, a fertile area for exploration by all these different um, academic disciplines is because, you know, the human capacity to make choices you know, to, to, to reflect on one's situation and then make choices based on that, um, is a huge area. And, um, and so, you know, the, the, the idea of, of agency is do it, it relates a little bit to the concept of free will. Do we, in fact, as human beings have the ability to make independent decisions for ourselves and, um, and, uh, and, and if so, what hel what helps us get better at that? What what can help us to make better quality decisions, um, decisions that you know are not irrational, decisions that are not um, working you know ag ag against us? Um, and you know the research that's been done in this whole area um, on decision making. You know we've got great research that's come out over the last thirty years, show that you know the most people are not very good decision makers. In fact, most people make, um, you know, poor decisions and make the same, you know, mistakes over and over and over again. So that's the bad news. The good news is that, you know, like anything else, if you learn more about it, you can actually become a much better decision maker when we're, this is whether we're talking about your personal life, your business life or anything else. Um, you know, what we like to say is, you know, in many respects, each and every one of us is the sum total of all the decisions we make over the course of our lives. And that's what agency is all about. It's it's all about how do we make those choices and how do we act on the choices we make? So it's a very fundamental concept that cuts right to the heart of what it is to be a human being. And in this era, in the day and age where we you know, have so much information coming at us, so many, so much messaging, so many things trying to influence us. It's become a really critical thing because the question of, you know, am I really truly in charge of my life? Am I truly making independent decisions? Um, or am I being influenced to such an extent that 
I'm really truly not making uh, my own uh, independent decisions. So we, 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 you know, so this has become, I think, a really pivotal uh, question of of the era that we all we all live in today. And so that brings up some interesting points. One, it amazes me how often things go back to the compound interest curve and, and that hockey stick type of a curve. And it's what you said, right? We make teeny little decisions and we keep making them. And over time, they compound and they get us to who we are today. And if we're not making those little decisions in the right way, they compound to the negative. And that's probably why you're seeing anxiety and all these things explode is because people have been making all these teeny little bad decisions over time. And it's finally starting to get to where you break the threshold. And then once you break the threshold, it just goes explosive. And so that's an interesting thing. Now, I, as I'm thinking back, though, I'm because I know in my life, I don't think we used to, as human beings, have agency in the past. I mean, if we were born 100 years ago, you know, your life was kind of in a somewhat predetermined, right? Your family told you where to live. People didn't move much. Your your choices for work were relatively limited. And even like growing up when I did, you know, you were told, go to school, get good grades, go to college. And somewhere along the way, someone said, oh, you're good at math, you know, go be a math person or you're good at this, go be a that person. But the person themselves never took the time to think, is this what I want to be, right? A lot of people, dad's a doctor, so you become a doctor. Um, Within our culture, it was, you know, you become a doctor or an engineer or a business owner. Every culture's got those things. So I don't think people used to have a lot of agency. And then when you're saying to think about things, what you're basically saying is critical thinking. And critical thinking has been around forever, but the people who were thought to think critically were the people who had tremendous amounts of money who could educate their kids. So it was a very small group of people who even were exposed to that knowledge to be able to make those choices. And I'm thinking what happened is, is now in today's world, we have a billion choices to make. When I was growing up, you, you didn't get to like you had three channels on TV. That was it. You, you picked one. <laughs> now we have choices, but no one has taught us how to make choices is what it seems like. Am I off the mark on this? No, I think you, you hit it right on the head, actually. Um, you, you know, the whole idea of uh, compounding interest is, is a great one to apply to this. I'd never thought of using that that concept um, and to, to use as an analogy, but we all make decisions each and every day. And most of them are small decisions. But I think, as you say, um, you know, we, those decisions start to add up over time and hopefully we make, you know, better decisions, more good decisions than bad. We take ourselves on a positive trend line and create a, a healthy, productive fulfilling life for ourselves. But if we, if we don't make good decisions and, and, you know, over time make a lot of bad, um, make a lot of small decisions that are not good decisions, we go the opposite direction. Um, and to your other point, other point, you know, yeah, it's not taught, you know, as I said, one of the, you know, one of the, um, you know, key moments in my life, was taking an economics class when I was 17 years old and just learning how the system works. And um, similarly, um, you know, I think, you know, we should all be taught how do we as human beings make decisions? How do we make choices? What's involved in that process? Um, And how do we make better quality decisions versus um, poor quality decisions. Well, you know, how, what's, what, what is it that we can do to control that? Because as you said, so beautifully, the, the, the environment has changed around us dramatically. And when, one of the things I like to say is if you think back 200 years and you think back to how, how people, um, lived 200 years ago, um, 
just take the United States. How did people live 200 years ago in the United States um, versus how do we live today? And obviously, you know, even if you don't know much about how people live 200 years ago, if you just get the basics of it, it's 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 just it's stunning. Right. It's stunningly it's stunningly different. The world is a completely different place. It challenges us in 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 so many different ways than it did 200 years ago. And, you know, it's a cliche to say it, but we we certainly live in the information age. And I think to your your point on critical thinking, critical thinking, which was probably a pretty rare skill, as you said, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, um, it's now become an essential skill. It's become an essential skill for for each and every one of us to be able to make better quality decisions because we live in an age with a tremendous amount of information coming at us 24 seven. And it, in it almost the environment we're in almost assumes that we have the capacity to use critical thinking skills to make choices. Um, but you know, as you know, I mean, there's lots of information, lots of messaging out there designed to influence people to make choices you know, in one direction, uh, to, you know, to sell a product or to, you know, to influence you in some way. And if you don't have critical thinking skills to kind of evaluate those, that information, you may not make the best decision. You may not make the best choice. So it's, so I loved what you said. It's, it's right on the money. And I think the big question is how do we get to be better decision makers. How, what is it that we as human beings can do to help ourselves to better adapt to the environment we live in today, which again is dramatically different from 200 years ago. And I would like to also say that human beings have genetically not changed really at all in 200 years. We're the same biological entities we were 200 years ago. So from a genetic standpoint, We've not evolved and become uh, different from, you know, who we were 200 years ago. And yet we are trying to adapt to a world that is, would be totally unrecognizable to somebody stepping out of uh, 200 years ago. And that's very true. And the reality is our schools haven't changed either. They're teaching to a world that no longer exists that was the world was very different in 1900 and and yet we're teaching to a world that was built in 1900 when here we are in 2020 and this is all really starting to click and move together and i think one of the first starting step for people and you talk about this in the book is essentially if you think about what life was like back then it was quiet Right. Things took time. Decisions took time. And in today's world, everything is instant. And I think part of that, and I know I do it every morning, is to go through that slow process of starting the day and quieting the mind and just being able to think. And I think that's an important part of it. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Well, it definitely has become a a very important foundational skill today to be able to quiet your mind. And that's why I'm sure a lot of the mindfulness training, the meditation, the yoga, all these kinds of things have taken off because it is one way for us to quiet our mind down. We are exposed, as you said, we're exposed to so much information now. Um, you know, the data on this is, you know, takes people's breath away. The number of advertisements were pitched in an average day, just the amount of information coming at us, um, 24 seven, um, you know, wherever you go, I mean, you know, you pump, you know, you go to the, you go pump gas now and there's a video screen, um, with, um, information coming at you while you're, you know, there for two minutes, um, three minutes pumping, pumping gas. So literally every, every, wherever there's an opening, information is coming at us. The, the, the downside of that is that we can't be alone with our thoughts. We can't engage in what we as psychologists call 
reflective thought. And reflective thought is when we can actually get some quiet time with ourselves and reflect on where do I find myself? What is my, what is the situation I'm in right now? And what do I want to do about it? What, 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 how many degrees of freedom do I have to act on, you know, this in the, the environment I find myself in? And, um, you know, and that requires some time to actually reflect. And that's what we found has, has, has sort of diminished you know, outside of most people's awareness, people haven't seen this. It's they haven't they haven't noticed it. It's almost like the frog in the the pot of, you know, boiling water. It's like the water just keeps getting warmer and warmer and warmer until all of a sudden the pot is near boiling. And all of a sudden the frog is like, get me get me out of this pot of boiling water. <laughs> this is, you know, it's it's. And so what you know, when I, I, I equate that to the idea of. We don't have we, we, we what's been eroded is that time that we used to have to actually contemplate and reflect on, our, again, where we find ourselves, what our situation is and what do we want to do about it. And when we don't have that as human beings, the quality of our decision making deteriorates rapidly. So we haven't noticed while that this this time for reflective thought has been chipped away at until all of a sudden we get to a place where, you know, overwhelm becomes a common experience. It's become something you experience every day um, for many people, you know, at least moments of, of just complete overwhelm. And, you know, that is related directly to this erosion of what you said so beautifully, you know, this kind of quiet time, you know, quiet time to actually reflect. Because when we don't have that time again, you know, the quality of our decision making deteriorates very fast. Today's episode is sponsored by Profit Answer Man podcast. Did you know that most small business owners hate looking at their financials? It's one reason they may struggle with business success. The Profit Answer Man podcast helps them ensure they are profitable and can pay their employees and weather the storms we all have to face. It's built on the Profit First methodology of pay yourself first. The Profit Answer Man podcast is a must listen to for every small business owner and anyone who wants to help them survive and thrive. Check it out on your favorite listening platform. This is helping me to understand one of the, the true, true benefits of having a coach is that they create the space and they force you to think about these things. What is it that you want in life? For all my clients, they all have life plans. They actually took months to sit down and think about what it is that they wanted. And then we put the steps in so that they can start doing it. And there's a quote from your book that kind of jumps out to me. It's, it's use your ability to deliberate, then act to create a life on your own terms. And this seems so in line with my messages that go along um, with that whole concept is we need to, we need to essentially stop. And I know for me, it's even difficult. I have that phone in my hand and I'm constantly looking at it. Right. And I don't think people realize that now that we understand behavioral psychology, at least the experts do, businesses are paying them ungodly amounts of money to figure out how to keep you looking at that phone or looking at advertisements or looking at these different things. They're essentially trying to take your agency away and to suck you in. And so it's all the more important to stop. Yeah, I think that's where and that's where this sort of capacity to reflect, which when we talk about just building that capacity in yourself, building that muscle, you know, it's like going to the gym uh, where you want to try to strengthen your back muscles or, you know, your leg muscles or whatever it is. This capacity to reflect is 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 so critically important to your level of agency in your life. Um, and as you said, with all the 
information that, that comes at us trying to entice us really and it is very enticing as you as you just said you know the devices are appealing there's just endless things to read and expose yourself to games to play um you know um people voicing opinions on this that and the other thing there's so many compelling things that can draw you in draw your attention in and it's not all bad i mean there's you know they, of, of course but if you get sucked into that um, too much and you spend too much time on all of that, that stuff that's trying to entice you in, um, you know, and we're talking primarily here about digital um, stimuli, you know, digital information. If you spend too much of your time on that, um, you know, what happens is that capacity to kind of quiet yourself and reflect um, is greatly diminished. And then you get to a point where, you know, you start to wonder, you know, am I really making um, my own choices? Am I really truly making well thought through deliberative choices in my own life? Or am I just being carried along by, um, you know, by how I'm being influenced by by other people? Um, And that can, you know, that may not be, depending on who you listen to, that may be an okay thing, or it may be a not okay thing. And so I think that, you know, that's what I think a lot of people find themselves with is, you know, hey, it's wonderful to have all this information. um, But a lot of that information is not necessarily good for you. A lot of that information is not reliable. A lot of that information is not accurate. A lot of that information is designed to somehow um, appeal to you Um, and, and get you to reach for it and engage with it because it, it serves somebody else's interest, right? It serves a commercial purpose or, uh, potentially a political purpose. So I think that, you know, that's, and that's, again, we're, we come right back Rocky to the idea of critical thinking and, um, you know, that, that capacity to, um, know what critical thinking is, know how to use it in your life. And we just, you know, uh, it's a still, uh, it's sort of, I think it's kind of back to the question about balance, who balances their checkbook, what percentage of people. And I think that the number of people who truly have, um, the capacity to think critically, who've developed that skill is still, um, a small minority of people in our country. And that's one of the problems. That's what we're trying to solve for because it doesn't need to be this way. Um, that is a learned skill. It's a learned ability and anybody, uh, you know, regardless of their level of education can learn how to become a better critical thinker. And that's very true. You have to, it is a learned skill. And I guess we were lucky in the sense that my kids went to a classical education school. And one of the principles of classical education is critical thinking and how to do that and how to discern. So they're not taught what to think. They're taught how to think. And it's it it wasn't intentional up front, but that decision has created for them the ability to make wise decisions today. And we'll see how it works out. They're still teenagers. So. But I I see a big difference in the way they do things versus other people. That's great. That's fascinating. That's a great that's a great observation. Yeah, it it, it, the under because it goes back to the thing that classical education was the way people were taught prior to our current education system. However, classical education was only available to people of means and money. So it was only available to a very small percentage of people in the world. And only a very small percentage of people had the ability and time to actually think because most people were in the fields or doing their work. It wasn't like today. And so, but the masses can have this today. One thing that surprised me in your book, and I didn't expect it, was where you talk about respecting your body and the principle of movement and that it's a very important factor. And if you look at society today, people don't move. Why did you focus on that as well? Yeah, I'm, glad, I'm so glad you asked that question because it's such an important part of, of, of human agency. So 
one of the, one of the, the one of the things that it's helpful for people to understand is our capacity to think you know as we've said is a you know a learned skill critical thinking is a learned is a learned skill however our capacity to think also relates directly to our emotions and how well we're able to uh, manage our emotions you know how 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 well we're able to you know decipher our emotions interpret them um, you know understand them you know all of that so our thinking is directly tied to our emotions and from the latest research on emotions and where emotions come from emotions largely come from our physical bodies believe it or not they they the, the emo- many emotions um, in fact, this is the work of Lisa Barrett, who's a you know, terrific psychologist, uh, done tremendous research on, on emotion and where it comes from, you know, the, some of the latest, the latest and greatest research. She's uh, out of Northeastern University in Boston. Um, she wrote a, a, a seminal book called How Emotions Are Made. And it's largely through our physical bodies that emotions are generated. So when our bodies are healthy and functioning well and in balance, our emotions are more in balance. And guess what? Our thinking improves. Our thinking skills improve. So our physical well-being is directly tied to, again, our emotional well-being, our emotional health, and our capacity to think and thus our capacity to make good decisions. So that's why the, uh, the, this, this whole idea of movement is so critical. Now, we wrote a chapter on the, the physical part of, 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 of ourselves and how that relates to human agency. Um, and movement is critical. We called it move. It's a principle of one of the seven principles of agency. And, and movement is, 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 is critical, but it's also... Um, about nutrition, um, how much rest you get, you know, again, how much movement or exercise you, you engage in. Um, so there's a number of different aspects to, to, um, this whole idea of movement, um, that relate to your physical health. And so our, you know, our central premise is, uh, you know, one of the more provocative things that I, I sometimes say is, is that, um, you know, we, we make decisions with our whole body. You know, it's not simply a split off, um, you know, intellectual exercise. The mind is connected to the body and we make choices or decisions with our entire body. So when your body is in better health, better working order and better balance, um, everything else works better. So the point of that whole principle, that chapter is, how do you do this? How do you get yourself in better physical working order? You don't have to go to the gym six days a week. You don't, you know, there's a lot of things you don't have to do, but movement of some type, physical movement needs to become a part of your daily routine. And as you said, Rocky, too many Americans um, are inactive. You know, you do have a small subset of the population that's very, very active physically, um, but it's still a minority of people. And it's one of the reasons why um, we have so much um, anxiety in 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 our society, and also so many chronic health problems. You know, problems like uh, diabetes and heart disease, and many of those things are related to how we, how we process stress and physical movement and, and getting, you know, good, 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 good diet and healthy sleep habits. Those are the things that help us to process stress, to, to, to kind of flush the stress hormones out of our bodies. And so if we're not doing those things, those stress hormones, cortisol builds up and builds up and builds up and it can cause all kinds of chronic health problems. And obviously that, that in, um, lessens your level of agency in your life. So that's why I'm so glad you brought that up because it's, it's not well understood the relationship that, um, that health, physical health has to our capacity to think and make decisions. 
Um, and we argue that it's it's central. It's it's a very it's it's inextricably linked to our capacity to make good choices for ourselves. And I think that's very true. Everyone's living in silos and businesses run in silos. And that is not the way of the world. Every action has reactions to it. That is a natural universal law. And I found it interesting how you talked about how our emotions are felt. And if you think about it, right, we talk about making decisions with our gut, right? We're talking about making them from feelings. And if you don't do the rational, logical part of it, then a lot of times we may make the wrong decisions. And I know you were asking my backstory before we started recording today, and I was sharing my journey. Part of that that I left out was as I started that journey, one of the unexpected side benefits was better health. I always struggled with weight and I've lost 50 pounds uh, over a couple of years. And that was a long time ago. I'm now in the best shape of my life. And that's not normal for people in their 50s to say, but it's because I move and I figured out there was I, what, what happened to me is I was given all the wrong information about how to eat, how to work out, how to do things. And once I figured out the secrets and how to do it correctly, I do it with not a lot of time. So I'm not in the gym for hours on end. It's doing things very focused that create a very strong body and give me the ability to move and have, I'm more flexible than I've ever been. I mean, maybe not as a kid, but it was kind of that unexpected side effect of, of doing the, the inner work. And so that was uh, quite interesting. Oh, it's really important because, and the other thing, just, just quickly to add to your, 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 your story is that, um, exercise movement, any kind of physical movement, you know, whether it's a walk, whether it's, you know, weeding your, your garden, um, any kind of physical activity improves your mood. It lifts your, your mood. It's, uh, you know, there actually are whole schools of, 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 of psychotherapy in, 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 in that involve movement that involve physical tasks um, that actually in, in, improve people's uh, mood. So it's really important for people to understand that the benefits of movement, of, of healthy movement each and every, each and every day, um, are enormous. I mean, they, 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 they help us enjoy our lives more um, in addition to helping us to be stronger, uh, resist um, injury, um, and to also think more clearly for ourselves. And that's true. You know, you had a story in your book that I really connected with. I think the boy's name was Jace. And it involved movement to get the kid to think. And it, it brought me back to the thought, when I was a kid, dads and sons played catch. And it was during catch that conversations happened. We, I don't think fathers and sons play catch anymore. Well, not as much as they could. And I think that's a really, it's an important point is that what's happening when a father and a son are playing catch? Well, you know, generally they're outside. Okay. So they're in nature, they're getting fresh air. Um, they're not on a screen. They're together. They're engaged in physical movement. Um, they're also, um, their minds, their minds are free to wander and and reflect as as they're playing catch um so it's 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 time where um you know through a repetitive uh physical activity outside which is another important part of movement it's very good for us to spend time outdoors as human beings it's another thing that creates that that, that furthers our human agency <clears throat> is getting out uh, outside <clears throat> so in that simple um, you know, kind of experience of, of, of throwing a ball back and forth to people between two people, um, something really powerful is actually happening there. And the social connection of it, which you mentioned is the other really important thing that's happening. It, it promotes relaxation. It promotes a feeling of uh, a sense of shared purpose. 
Um, and it also lowers, um, you know, kind of defenses. So it makes it easier, as you said, to talk. I mean, just to talk, to chat, to, you know, to connect and feel and, and to feel uh, a sense of, of human connection. And that's another incredibly important part of human agency is this, I, this idea of connection, connection to other people, because it turns out that our ability, our, our, our ability to express our, our, our agency for ourselves is mo is crucially connected to um, who we have in our lives, who we surround ourselves with, what kinds of people, um, you know, particularly people closest to us, you know, so f close uh, family, close friends, um, who are we surrounded by? And if we surround ourselves with, um, you know, generally healthy, supportive, encouraging people, our level of agency increases. Um, you know, so our ability to make good choices improves. If we surround ourselves with more negative people and we're connected to people who drag us down or worse yet, people who abuse us in some way or another, um, our level of agency uh, plummets. And so in that simple game of catch between father and son, there's many th deep things going on um, all at the same time that actually promotes a healthy sense of human agency. So I would say, I'm really, that's what I'm so glad you mentioned that. And I, it just connected with me. And so that was one of the reasons that, that it was so important. Well, in that story you mentioned, Jace, um, in particular, he, um, you know, he was a boy who had experienced a profound loss in his life. Uh, you know, my co-author, um, you know, actually worked with Jace um, for many years and um, his, Jace's father had died just suddenly um, playing soccer. Um, in his early forties, um, when Jace was a small boy. So he lost his dad when he was a kid and he couldn't talk about that. He, 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 you know, felt that loss each and every minute of every day as a young boy. And he didn't know what to do with it. And it was eating away at him. And my colleague who, you know, co-author, uh, Anthony Rayo, worked with him for years and found that simply playing catch with him in the office with a Nerf ball and they would play um, every week uh, for, you know, 30 minutes a week, they'd throw that Nerf ball back and forth and they were indoors in, a, in an office. Um, but that was what enabled um, Jace to open up and begin the grieving process for what he'd lost when, when his dad uh, collapsed on that soccer field. And so, you know, it's, it's movement. It is movement. We were made to move. We're made to move and we're made to, to be connected to other people. And when we, when we do both of those things, um, it's a great way to um, develop greater personal agency. And probably why I connected so much with that is that my mom passed away when I was little. And so it was that kind of human connection of understanding what he was going through and then seeing how he he changed it. And there's another story in there that also I kind of connected with, which was Bob. And he had a behavior or a belief that was created when he was nine years old and it carried through into his life. Could you share a little bit about that? Yeah, I think, you know, Bob, Bob was um, a, a guy who also had a, a, an early formative experience in his life um, where he, he had a, a sibling um, who was born uh, with, with profound, um, you know, issues and um you know health issues uh, mental um difficulties and um and from a very early age um he he was encouraged to grow up really really fast by his parents and to be um ultra responsible and um if he didn't you know take care of everything 
um, the whole world would fall apart. And so he, 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 he grew up very quickly um, and had a very strong set of beliefs about, you know, how important it was to do everything perfectly and um, never, ever drop the ball on anything. And so when, it, when he had his own son and, um, and, and, you know, and his son, interestingly, interestingly, was about the same age that Bob was at the time um, when, when Bob's sister was born with all the physical problems. Um, he, when his own son reached that about that age, um, he started getting much, much more harsh and judgmental of his own son. And, uh, he, he basically, um, was, was, was sort of putting his own uh, beliefs onto his own son. And, you know, his own son didn't know where it was coming from. It, it just changed all of a sudden. And his wife noticed it. And, you know, what he was expecting of his son became really um, just way too much. And his relationship with his son really deteriorated. Um, and he noticed he was angry all the time. And, um, you know, the father, that is. And um, so he finally, you know, his wife encouraged him to uh, seek out some therapy to explore this, to understand what was, what was going on? Why is this happening? Wh why did you change so suddenly? And why are you being so hard on our, 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 our oldest boy? And he realized that it came from a belief that he had developed when he was a small kid and he was, you know, challenged by his parents to um, grow up really fast and become an adult when he was essentially uh, 11 years old. And so, you know, he, he just automatically was applying those beliefs to his own son, even though the situation didn't clearly didn't warrant it. You know, his, his son wasn't, they weren't there, they, you know, they, they, there was not the same set of circumstances. And so his son just, what his son understood was, boy, my dad just has become really punishing and really unforgiving and really uh, you know, mean, mean to me. And I don't understand why it is. I can't please him. There's nothing I do that's good enough. And so anyway, it was only through, through therapy that he explored this and was able to understand where this belief had come from. That he, was, that he was able to then to kind of allow that belief to, to release its hold on him. He was able to, to adjust that belief um, through, you know, reflection. And he, reflect, he reflected on that. So with the help of a therapist, he was able to reflect on this and, 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 and learn and grow. and um, adjust that belief. So that belief was no longer, um, you know, controlling him. So it's, a, it's an interesting story. And we all have them, right? We have these beliefs that are created in childhood and we need to, we need to examine them and question, do they serve us still? Or were they a belief that came about for whatever reason that needs to be challenged? Which I think brings us to the next question, which is, what do high agency people do differently in their lives? Well, one thing they do, it's related to what you just talked about in terms of beliefs, is that high agency people are, are, are learners. They, they learn each and every day and they actively position themselves to learn. So they, 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 they you know, give um, free license to their curiosity um, they seek out um, the company of people who um, can can teach them something, people they can learn from. They also seek out information um, from from reliable sources, information that they can can count on as being accurate. And they learn. So they they seek out um, uh, again to to learn uh, each and every day. And they also importantly they're willing to challenge pre-existing beliefs. So um, I think high agency people, they may not articulate it in this way, but, but through working, through, through studying them and interviewing many of the, these people, um, what we found is that high agency people see their beliefs, the beliefs they operate with, um, as, as aids to navigation. Those beliefs help them navigate their lives um, and they're based on information that they have at the time. Um, but 
they can update their beliefs as they learn, as they grow, as their understanding deepens on any particular topic. They actually go back and adjust their beliefs based on what they've learned. And so, you know, we they, they also seem high agency people seem to separate their personal values, you know, the things that they value the most um, from their personal beliefs. So I'll give you an example a, a, a value, you know, values tend to be, you know, if I asked you, what are the what are the five things you, that are the, the most important values that you have as a human being? Um, you know, it may take you a little time, but you, you'd put together probably a pretty good list. Values tend to be shorter. For most people, their core values are a list of, you know, three to 10 things, per, for example. Um, and those things tend to be unchanging. You know, uh, values can be uh, such, such things as, um, you know, I, 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 I you, know, it, it, you know, one of the things I value is um, everybody having an equal opportunity or um, I, I value, um, uh, you know, not the, the, the acquisition of, of, of knowledge, you know, my, those are my, you know, so, so that's an example of a value, someone's core value, their beliefs are different. Their beliefs are something that they develop based on their understanding and knowledge of the world around them or of a particular situation. So what high agency people do is they're always learning they're always exposing themselves to new information and they're not afraid to adjust their beliefs as they learn more. And so that's an important aspect of agency. It's they're more flexible. They're more flexible in um, in in adjusting their beliefs. They don't rigidly adhere to a particular um, set of beliefs, but rather they, they adjust those beliefs as they go. They see them as temporary guides to them. So that's one important thing that high agency people do. The other thing is high agency people, as I said earlier, surround themselves with people who are encouraging people they can learn from people who challenge them at times. Um, but people who generally support them and help them to, to grow and develop um, that's another really critical thing that high agency people do. The other thing that they do is um, they also have a, an understanding of how they make decisions. They they often tend to have a framework that they use when they, especially when they're making an important decision. Um, and you know, there's a lot of research on how how we as human beings make decisions now that we didn't have 30 or 40 years ago. And, you know, it's, it boils down to essentially the current thinking that there, there's, 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 there's basically two modes of, of human thinking. Um, there's system one thinking and there's system two thinking. And system one thinking is more automatic. It's more intuitive, more reflexive. Um, it's those decisions we make, generally make quickly. Um, based on our in intuition, based on our intuitive understanding of a situation. System two thinking, on the other hand, equates more to critical thinking. It's slower thinking. It's analytical thinking. And there are certain decisions we all have to make in our lives, and whether we're, you know, it's a business decision or a personal decision, where we really need to use system two thinking. We need to be, uh, we need to, to, to kind of analyze it more. We need to really have a deeper understanding of what's at stake, what's going on, if we're going to have a chance at making a really good decision. Some decisions um, are fine using the faster, more automatic, intuitive thinking, system one. But high agency people know kind of, you know, when to use which mode of thinking. They know when it's time to bring out the big guns and do a, a, and slow things down and do more deliberative kind of analytical reasoning to help them make a good quality decision. And they know when it's okay to use their intuition. But the thing is, is that, that, that most, most of us, most human beings, most all the time are just using system one thinking, which is the fast, automatic, quick decision uh, making. And um, and, you know, what's important is that, you know, that 
type of decision making can lead you astray at times. Um, we talk in the book about how to how to utilize that system one type thinking, how to develop the skill to use that wisely. So you're using it in a way that helps you and you're also not using it um, in ways that don't help you. Um, so, you know, high agency people do, you know, they're able, they have the ability to use both of those things, system one and system two thinking. Um, and they kind of con, they kind of consciously know when they're using which one and they actually oftentimes use the two together because they actually can be used, um, together. Um, so, so those are a few things that higher agency people do um, that really kind of um, distinguish them, right? And that kind of, in some ways, allow them to um, to to sort of you know create lives that are more uh, in keeping with you know their own interests and their own values. And I think it's important for people to understand. This is not something that happens overnight. Like you have to spend a lot of time doing this work and little by little you change your belief system, the way you do things and the way you behave. And I think, you know, you're talking about the the two different types of thinking and it I think it's Amazon, maybe it's another tech company that they talk about decision making as uh, a type one decision or a type two decision. And a type one decision is is a decision that doesn't affect overall outcomes. It's not an irreversible decision. So those decisions, they're willing to do much faster. But a type two decision is if I make this decision, it's going to have consequences that are not able to 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 really change. Or it's going to be something that's much more permanent. And those decisions, they take a lot of time to make. Absolutely. Higher stake decisions. And, yes. You know, what I would say, however, is that um, as a general rule, that that I, I think that is actually um, accurate. However, um, there are different types of intuition. So if we think about system one thinking, and again, that's the, the, the type of thinking that's more automatic, it's more intuitive based. Um, there are different forms of intuition. Uh, we talk about these in our book, how to develop them. One of them is called expert intuition. And expert intuition is intuition that you know someone has developed over many, many years, maybe even decades of experience. So they become expert in something. And you know, at times that ex they can pull on their their the use of their expert intuition to guide them in making a decision. A classic example um, that everybody's heard of is the example of that U.S. Air flight that um, that Captain Sully Sullenberger landed on on in the Hudson River on and did a water landing. Um, the decision that he and his co-pilot had to make in the cockpit when the engines failed and the plane was losing altitude and there was no way they they were able they knew they would not be able to make it back to the airport to land safely um they pulled on believe it or not they pulled on their expert intuition to make a decision which was to land that plane in in the river and um you know because they didn't have time to um go through all their checklists um, to make a a slower, you know, more deliberative decision, um, it, they were exclusively he was exclusively relying on his expert intuition when he made that decision, and it obviously worked out for him. But the point is, I mean, to 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 you know, is that that was in a in a in a relatively narrow range of circumstances, um, does intuition is intuition in in a high stakes kind of decision where you said, as you said, Rocky, you know, something huge is at stake. Um, generally, almost always, we want to be using the slower system to kind of more, more rational thinking, critical thinking uh, approach. But there are exceptions to that. And if you learn how to use your intuition, how to develop that, because that's a learned, that can be a learned skill as well. 
if you learn, and most people don't learn anything about how their intuitive capacities work. So we talk about that in the book as well. How do you, how do you develop those intuitive skills more? What are the different types of intuition? When do you use those? When do you use that? How do you use that? How do you use it also in conjunction with, you know, the slower, more analytical thinking? Because a lot of times, you know, for in high stakes decisions, you know, of great importance, you know, you can use both. I mean, you actually can use both your intuitive and your more logical, analytical reasoning skills, um, which will improve your hit rate. So um, it's a fascinating topic. I mean, it's just, you know, it's, 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 as you know, I mean, you know, business decisions, you help people make business decisions all the time. And, you know, some decisions are all, you know, logical, analytical, reasoning based. Some decisions are much, much more uh, intuitively based. And some, some decisions are a combination of both. And I think our point is when you use both of those things, uh, both of those modes of thinking, you know, sort of properly and, and appropriately, uh, you know, the quality of your decision making goes up dramatically. And that it does. And we've only scratched the surface of the book. And so I encourage people, if this is of interest to you and you want to make changes, Go dig into it because we really, really just barely covered the beginnings of, of this entire topic. It's time to learn the secrets of life. What's your secret to living an abundant life? Expose yourself to new learning each and every day and be willing to challenge your beliefs. And that's important, right? You have to constantly challenge yourself and make sure that what you're doing is correct. What did you learn later in life that you wish you would have learned sooner? The power of getting quiet and reflecting on uh, myself and my situation and where I want to take myself. And I have found that. When I get, like, especially for a longer period of time, it's pretty phenomenal. If you can get out, whether you go into nature, go camping, or just shut everything off for like 24 to 48 hours, it's amazing things happen. And a lot of the things that we talked about today, you'll get a chance to actually work on and improve in yourself. Exactly. No, that's, you, you got it. That's exactly right. If you were to give an 18 year old one specific piece of wisdom, what would it be? Learn how to think critically, uh, you know, develop that skill in yourself and, 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 and question it throughout your life. Commit yourself to questioning uh, assumptions, the assumptions you're making and the assumptions that other are making. And then one last thing is don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to go your own way. And I think that for a lot of 18 year olds, that's that's a big thing. Don't just follow a path because you're told to follow a path. You may end up climbing the wrong mountain and then you have to start over. <laughs> that's right. Or climbing the same mountain that everybody else is climbing. Correct. And that may not be the one for you. So take the time to think about it. If people would like to find you, connect, learn more about your work, what's the best way for them to do that? Probably the best way is you know, visit our website, our, our book website, which is powerofagency.com. Uh, there's a lot of information on the website. Um, also directs you if you want to buy the book, how to buy the book. A lot of articles um, related to agency and also the the COVID crisis and decision making um, during the time of of, of COVID nineteen. So power of agency power of agency dot com. And I will put that in the show notes so that it's easy for everyone to click and find it. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks so much, Rocky, for having me. I really enjoyed the discussion and you have excellent questions. Wow, that was an amazing conversation. I suggest you take the time to turn off the noise and listen to your thoughts. Slow down. Get out into nature. Use your ability to deliberate. Then act to create a life on your own terms. We all need a decision framework, just like we need an investment policy and a life plan. That's a lot of work, 
but it's worth living the best life ever. I recommend you get the book. It's a great read. We barely touched on it in this interview. This week's action step, if you don't already do it, it's time to balance your checkbook. Guys, I seriously hope you already do, because you could be losing money and have no idea. It happened to me the other month where my AT&T bill skyrocketed, and I didn't realize I was making calls to Canada. I would have never noticed. I would have never picked it up. I would have never been able to negotiate the price down and get a refund and do those things if I wasn't constantly paying attention. You've got to pay attention to your money. We need to be deliberate in life and know what we want and then take the steps to go achieve it. In our next episode, Rebel Brown is on and she's going to share the science and art of paying attention. And I know I need work on that too. We're so easily distracted and that prevents us from reaching our goals and creates overwhelm. If you want help putting together your plans, just email me. It's rocky at richersoul.com and we can set up a time to chat and see if I can help you or at least point you in the right direction. The call's free. Thanks for listening. Have an abundant week.